anybody out there that's struggling with it or knows somebody struggling with it, it is worth it to like Learn research more. about yeah. it because it, there's such a huge stigmatism around eating disorders in general that it's just image and it is so not like that's What's, like that's the biggest misconception you think? i'd say in understanding it at least this is call me chris and you can call her chris or rather christina collins a canadian hairstylist well she was a hairstylist until a little app called tiktok came along and changed her life forever Chris is one of the most prolific creators on the internet, having amassed nearly 50 million followers on TikTok alone, creating hilarious skits with her ever-growing roster of characters. Riley, isn't he pretty? <laughs> you may have also seen her on YouTube where she's fast approaching 10 million subs, doing things like reacting to five minute crafts videos or even trying the crafts herself. Am I pretty now? Needless to say, the audience has fallen in love with her sense of humor and the way she makes them feel. But recently, Chris has been more open with her audience about some difficult things going on in her personal life. Because I have struggled with uh, my mental health for a very long time. It's, it's been uh, rough lately. Chris and I have known each other for over a year now. So I asked if she would be interested in coming on my show to discuss her health journey in detail. Chris said yes. And what followed was an intimate and powerful discussion about some difficult topics. Content warning. The following interview contains discussion of depression, suicide, and eating disorders. If that sounds like something you're comfortable with, join me now on The Checkup with Dr. Mike as we not only call her Chris, but see Chris for the inspiring three-dimensional person she really is. You've been through a lot <laughs> medically. Yeah. And non-medically. Yeah. Is that so, fair to say? In life, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Would you say you're an old soul? Yeah, I've been told that by every person that comes across me. Every? Pretty much. What? Why do they say that? I don't know. I guess I'm just really mature, which is, I'm not, I'm, I'm not humor wise, but. Yeah, I, I was going to say for someone who does voices for a living and yeah. character play and silly character play. Yes. I think that's because the, the, the me off camera is very, you know, controlled and not as flamboyant as I am on camera. Mm. Why? So I think that's, it's a form of like escapism for me. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. Why Why do you not allow your inner child to enjoy the outside world? I don't know. I don't know. I've always struggled with that, though. I don't know. I, I like it's it's just putting on masks, mm. you know, and I've just learned that from being young that that's easier to do than the alternative. What's the alternative? <laughs> Showing my true emotions. <laughs> like laughing and being silly? Yeah, I guess. And I guess it all stems from like, uh, like having mental health issues and that kind of thing. Mm. And, and what I mean, like, if I'm depressed, it's hard to be that person I'm supposed to be on camera in real life. Like I'm, that, that's my job. So I'm expected to do that mm. on camera. So it's so the other way. I, I guess it's hard to be the person I am on camera in real life sometimes. That's what I'm trying to say. But the person you, oh yeah, but the person you are being on camera is sometimes the act and the person you're being sure. in real life is really you. For sure, yeah. Oh, so you really are the mature soul, and then for the camera, you put be. on an act. Yeah, I mean, oh. not not necessarily an act, but, but it's just like you're performing. Yeah, yeah, essentially. You've become, or I guess, we're born very accident prone. <laughs> yeah. Take me through that. Yeah, I don't know. I was just reckless as a child. I like to do a lot of things, whether it was like climbing trees, going really fast down hills on skateboards or bikes, and I was just. Um, a daredevil, if you will. Mm. I don't really know. I just have always been like that. Or like parkour as a kid. I think I started it. I think I did. You started parkour? <laughs> I tried to, I think. I was doing it before I even knew it was a thing. Was this a but, rebellion against parentals or? Mm, probably a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Um, because my mom was very protective of me, my, me and my older sister, because we were the first two. And the other ones, she was just like left to their own devices. And like we took care of them. But um, I was just like, screw that. I'm going to go, you know, climb a 50 foot tree and wave at her from the top of it. She had a heart attack. It was, it was fun. But then you get a reaction out of her, too. Uh, so I was a little bit of um, an attention, <laughs> you know. So <laughs> Attention what? We can pee whoop it. Attention whore, uh, if you will. Okay. Um, but in a bad way. Like Why in a bad way? Like I like to get big reactions out of them, whether Ooh. it was a laugh or whether it was like, a, oh, my gosh. Like, it was just like, I didn't realize I was performing for my parents before 
I, I knew it was performing, but that's that's kind of what it was. It it almost reminds me of when Steve O was sitting here and he was saying that he was doing the same thing. He was an attention whore. He loved it. He would record himself on VHS back in the day. Yes, it wasn't from other people. It was just from my parents. Like mm. I don't. I. It's funny because I I never like I never looked at movies or TV or anything like that and wanted to be that. Like I've never actually wanted to be on camera or have that kind of attention. Really? I um I always wanted anonymity, but I just when I was younger, I just kind of wanted that attention from my parents because my sister is just good at everything. Jessica, my older sister, um, whether it's sports, academics, all that. So I just felt like I was like just a lower tier. So I had to sh like shock and awe them in some way, and that was in humor or doing these like crazy stunts all the time. Wait, so in addition to the crazy stunts, you were also doing like some kind of humor stuff as well? Yeah, just in general. Like I was just always a smart ass and like trying to make them laugh, whether it was like a comeback or something like that. Or even if I was getting in trouble, like I would find ways to make them laugh, which kind of... <laughs> like, like give me an example. It, They'll be like, I can't believe you did this, Christina Lee. Yeah. Hollowell Collins. The, yeah, exactly. That's yes. And then I would just like come back with a joke and make them laugh. And that gave me less punishment. Yeah. So exactly. you manipulated the system from an exactly. early age. Exactly. Yes. Very smart. <laughs> yeah. Did you have the characters already in full effect when you were younger? Uh, not the specific ones I oh, had, yeah. but yeah. I was absolutely the kid that had imaginary friends, like full fledged. Like I would talk to them and like by myself or like when I, I lived in the corner as a kid, which I don't know if you have that punishment, but yeah, stand course. in the corner, right? Well, in Russian culture, it's physical plus the corner, like yes. the corner is where you go to After. recover. Yes, that is the same here. Okay. I got, yeah, the I got all the spanks out of all the kids. I mean, they might've gotten a little bit, but I got the wooden spoon, the whole, the whole barrage. Um, and then I go in the corner, but then I wasn't allowed to bring like my dolls or toys or anything because I would be very entertained. I loved the corner. The corner was great. Mm. And so I'd play with my fingers and I would talk to myself like this. And uh, my mom could attest to that. And she would get so annoyed. And then if I, she's like, you can't, ha I would have to have my hands behind, beside myself because <laughs> she hated that I entertained myself. I was so good on my own. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. What, what imaginary friends did you have? Do you um, I don't remember names, but... They were just, just like other kids. <laughs> I sound insane. <laughs> I might be schizophrenic. <laughs> what do you no. mean? You're allowed imaginary friends as a kid? Yeah. I used to have a t-shirt that I wore when I was like 13 that said, I have lots of friends. You just can't see them. Yeah. Right. It was and, from Hot Topic. Mm -hmm. Nice. I like Hot Topic, but I wasn't allowed to shop there. <laughs> I wasn't either. Was I it? went secretly. Oh, you broke the rules. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, um, yeah, I was, I, now I'm thinking maybe I saw ghosts, but. You saw ghosts? No, I'm just thinking my imaginary friends were like so oh. so real to me. That they felt like ghosts. Yeah. And what you would talk to them about real life stuff or you would create imaginary situations? Uh just like you know when you're playing pretend and I don't you're just know. like <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, that's my whole life. So <laughs> so right now we're in a we're in a castle in like a room and we're being held hostage. And like I would just like create these scenarios in my head. Mm -hmm. And then I would just play them out with my imaginary friends. Wow. While these days, Chris might spend many of her afternoons inside playing funny characters on TikTok, she isn't exactly a homebody. In fact, Chris is an adventurer and an injury prone one at that, having broken countless bones falling out of moving golf carts or trying to Mary Poppins her way off a roof holding onto a canopy of umbrellas. So given all the injuries she sustained, I asked her which one was the most painful. N uh, my clavicle. What happened? Was awful. Uh, that was playing soccer. I was in full sprint. I was a, a left winger. So I would sprint up and down the field. I was sprinting. And then the other winger was sprinting with me uh, to get the ball. And she tripped me. Trish. And I just, it was so, I didn't have time to put my hands out because I was running so fast and she tripped me. So I just landed right on it and went, and I still have like a bump. But um, my coach at the time too didn't like believe it was bad. So he like went to grab my hand and pulled me up and I think he made it worse. And I've never screamed so loud in my life, I don't think. And I had to and I had to sit in the hospital for so long. Thanks, Canadian healthcare, for so long. <laughs> I think I was sitting for like three hours with this and it was just like, I don't know, why does this hurt so bad? Like I mean the brachial here. plexus is there. Yeah. Um did you have any nerve weakness in the hand after that? 
Because some people, like I've had <sighs> patients that were involved in auto accidents that would get a clavicular fracture. Yeah. And then they would have like a wrist drop because they would lose oh, the, the motor no, function. No, I haven't had that. No. It wasn't a clean break. So maybe that's why mm. it was, um, what, I guess it was just a fracture. Fracture Whatever. means break. break. Break, yeah, right. So so like you're saying it wasn't fully displaced, it wasn't, maybe? T- no, yeah, it okay. wasn't completely displaced. Yeah, yeah, displaced. So maybe that's why. Yeah. Um, but still, still the most painful by Well, yeah, especially far. if someone's pulling on you. Yeah, that's my like ankle was pretty bad too, but that was probably the worst. And that happened how? Ankle was basketball. Going up and landing on it wrong. Uh, that Stupid. happens to me a I lot. got mad hops. I went so high. Did you dunk? <laughs> yeah. You could dunk? No. Oh. No. If I jumped off somebody's shoulders. <laughs> yeah, if you jumped off with your little <laughs> umbrella, <laughs> yeah. you could dunk, I'm yeah. sure. I'd probably still break my ankle. The umbrella doesn't work. <laughs> So Chris is no stranger to pain and medical emergencies, which means she's also no stranger to the Canadian healthcare system. If you watch any of my videos, you know I have a ton of critiques of the American healthcare system, which is why I was so curious to hear how things have gone for Chris in the Great White North. A couple of years ago, Chris said she was suffering from a kidney infection, and the Canadian healthcare system left her with more questions than answers. I went in and I was having the worst pain in my life. I thought I might have like meningitis or something because it was the pain was so bad, and they were debating you had a headache uh yeah fever or what not headache but whatever and um i was uh, assuming they were going to do a spinal tap or something but anyway the pain was so bad but they uh didn't they did imaging or whatever they needed to do and then um they gave me some pain meds and they sent me home and said come back tomorrow if it gets any worse and they didn't give me any sort of like diagnosis for going home or anything like that so like but this is the er this is er so the er sends you home and says come back yeah then it's not an emergent. Yeah. <laughs> or it, why, why do they? Why did did they feel like you weren't emergent, or that I, the ER was so busy? Did they give you? No, they didn't. There was no. There was no reasoning. I mean, I was by myself too, so there was nobody to uh, vet for me, which maybe was an issue too, because I was in a lot of pain, mm-hmm. and I wasn't in any place to argue. I guess so. I don't know. Doctor tells you something, you're just you just do it. And you're yeah. like, well, like, I wanted people to empower themselves to ask the questions for sure. So like. Sure. Don't just do that if, no, if that happens no. to you. Because even if you were sent home and said to return, mm-hmm. they should at least tell you what the preliminary diagnosis is, right. at least a presumptive diagnosis, yeah. uh, what the plan is going to be, and then what you should be on the lookout for. Yeah, that's, that's like what issue. could go wrong that you would need to come back before it's that time. Right, right, yeah. And, and they like, didn't give you that. And it, and it was a kidney fe- infection at the end of, okay. at the, end of the day, which I'm assuming can get bad if i don't treat it very bad and i didn't get the could go into sepsis that's yeah, yeah. exactly low blood so pressure like, septic shock dead boom yeah that's and of course i'm googling shit and yeah. so it was just like okay and then i went back the next day and they're like oh yeah you need antibiotics and they gave me antibiotics through iv and then they sent me home to go get some from my other doctor or like to go to the pharmacy they, yeah the pharmacy yeah. so i was like and that was the most recent one. That's but yeah, but it, like all my broken bones, like especially my clavicle, it was like almost four hours I was waiting there screaming in pain. Like it was brutal. And like people with like colds are going in before me. Like that's weird. It's very messy. It's Why always is that happening busy. in your system? Well, be- anybody goes in for anything because it's, I mean, if you have insurance and that kind of thing, it's it's free basically. But doesn't right? everyone have insurance? Uh, not necessarily. I thought like it's there, nationalized you, and everyone has insurance. <clears throat> If you don't have insurance, it, it like, it, it might cost a fee, and it's it's very small, it's very small. I don't know what the I don't I I don't know I I don't want to speak on it. Too How do much you get insurance in Canada? You have to apply for something. You just buy it, like regular insurance, like. So just, you have to pay for your health insurance. So then, why do they say unless it's free? you're at a job where you have health insurance? Like this here. sounds very similar. It, yeah, I know, I know. That's why it's kind of like everybody just assumes because you're Canadian, you can go to the hospital and it. It's free. It, like costs nothing. But well, first of all, you're paying health insurance, right? Yes. Monthly. Yes. And then you said you also received the bill from your ER. At uh, the time I wasn't. Uh, the time I wasn't. And I'm just self employed. So mm. again, very small, but like What's very small? Like hundreds of dollars? Like yeah, hundred bucks maybe, if that. Okay. So it's uh I mean that's way more reasonable than what bills would be. Yeah, here. for sure. People here it's like Tylenol fifty dollars. Hundred yeah. band eight hundred. Yeah. No, I'm terrified. I mean I I you know, sliced my hand here with cutting an avocado and I had to pay like a couple grand to get stitches in my hand here because well, I didn't have You went to a fancy schmancy plastic yes, surgeon. But which that's a good idea for the hand. I, yeah. But it's like yeah, it's worth it to have. And again, I was stupid and didn't have like travelers, travelers insurance. insurance. Yeah. So 
And when when you um, need to see a specialist, is that a long wait? Yes. Oh my God, yes. Unless you want to pay out of pocket. Like if I was to, I wanted to get an MRI like I did for my knee. Um, and at the time I didn't have any money. So I had to wait. It was like eight months. No way. It was insane. No Unless way. you had a random opening or something. That's like another doctor from the UK at Hope Sick Notes. He was just here. He um, said that it takes up to a year to get a replacement hip or knee or something. So oh, yeah. It's anytime crazy. Anytime it's like nationwide healthcare, it's not great timing wise. No. Is there like urgent visits available? For sure. Yeah, for sure. Like if you're it, it, like if it's an immediate issue, like if you can't walk, then I'm. Well, yeah, I mean more so in the in the scope of like, for example, if I have a patient that comes in with really bad acid reflux and I'm mm -hmm. like, they need a scope right away to see if they have an ulcer, but it's not an emergency, meaning like right. they're not dying right now, right. they're not losing blood, but they're very, very uncomfortable. So I'll get them seen the next day yeah. and then the following day they might get the, uh, the endoscope done. Yeah. Is that how it works in Canada as well? Uh, yeah, I'm assuming if you get like a doctor's recommendation, um, like I've had my doctor recommend I, I go get testing but none of it's been like faster emergency so i can't i can't vouch for how fast that would be but i mean well i've had like my dad has had pretty brutal knee injuries and that kind of thing and he still had to wait Ugh. longer than you would here like yeah. if it's not days, it's like weeks. As a family medicine doctor, I'm trained to provide a wide variety of healthcare services to my patients, including mental health care. I was curious to know how Canada's system handles mental health, and that's actually something Chris has had a lot of experience with. Recently, Chris has been more public discussing her experiences with an eating disorder, or ED, something she sought care for in Canada. I, I went to outpatient care uh, for my ED and no, I think at the time my, my parents were kind enough to pay for that, um, but it wasn't covered by insurance. So I think, and same as like therapy or that kind of thing. That's not covered. In some jobs you do. Like my parents have government jobs uh -huh. and they have like a certain amount covered by it, which it. I'm assuming is similar to here, but they have like good government jobs. So I th I'm, most jobs don't have that. In general, if you don't have a specific government type job, mm -hmm. you're just a regular citizen, you're paying your dues for the healthcare. Do you have access to therapy? Uh, like, is it, uh, is it added forward? into my yeah. like insurance? Not yeah. mine, no. Oh. So I wow. have to pay out of pocket. Yeah, that's. And is it expensive there? Yeah. What's expensive? Depends on who you're going to, but it like, can range from anywhere yeah. from like you know, uh, I don't know, like a hundred dollars an hour to five hundred dollars wow. an hour. Just so depends. Really and it pricey. depends whether you're going to like a psychiatrist or psychologist, like psychologist, or social worker. Yeah. Navigating the mental health care space with so many specialists and so few openings for new patients can add insult to injury when you're in need of care. Fortunately, Chris's family was there to support her. The last thing you want to do is call a bunch of people, talk to a bunch of people, maybe get no's or yeses or whatever. You just don't want, like, it's the last thing you want to do. So how did you manage that? I wouldn't have, I'd, I'd be dead without my family doing that. Oh, so your family support came in. And how did you have that conversation with your family to say that you needed it? I didn't. It? it was like an intervention. Really? How mm -hmm. did that happen? Um, I was, uh, this was like at the height of like the worst of my e eating disorder, which was um, anorexia. And I was, I had a plethora of health issues and like heart problems and all that kind of stuff. Related to the anorexia? Related to that. M my mom had made me go into my doctor and have like an initial, um, uh, look over to see what was going on, gave me the diagnosis and everything. Um, and then he had separate conversations with my parents um, about what was going on and basically said what I just said. Like, if she keeps going this way, like, she she'll die. Um, so they kind of just put their foot down. And at the time, I was still living with my parents and everything. So it's like, I didn't really have a choice. Like, I didn't care, but they cared. And, like, I cared about what they thought. So... Mm -hmm. That's the only way, but it's it's sad when when people don't have that backup like that because, like, how else do you do it? Yeah, like access to healthcare, mental health care. It really should be healthcare because mental health care is yeah, healthcare. same thing is the most important. Mm -hmm. Like, it matters less what kind of doctor you have, like psychiatrist, psychologist, yep. social worker. Just the fact that you have someone. Yeah, it matters even more what your social support system is. And in fact, that's one of the more. first questions we ask. Yeah. 
So do you have friends, family, people to call? Even when we do crisis planning, if we're yeah. worried about some kind of ideation surrounding end of life, right away, what's the plan going to be if you start having these thoughts? Who are you going to call? Do you have someone? If not, yeah. we'll get them the nationwide hotline numbers that are available so that they'll at least have that. Right. Right. And I mean, that's, that is good. That's another thing. Like I had, I am one of the hotline users. So, um, I had been in the past, uh, because I didn't feel comfortable talking to other people like that. So it's nice to have a third party to do that with, but I didn't really have my doctor, which my doctor's great, but he didn't really sit down and say like, give me all that. Like, say like, this is the plan. Sure. There was no plan. It was kind of like, here's, uh, a psychiatrist you should go to, I, he recommended I go to inpatient, but I wanted, like, I refused to not work because I was working as a hairdresser and I, you know, need to make money to live. Um, so I, he recommended outpatient and I pushed that away, like for a really long time until my parents finally convinced me to do that. So was it your parents plus your siblings? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it, it was, was a traditional. It, honestly, it was mm, Jessica, my older sister first, I'd say that mm. she really, really pushed for it or like pushed my parents to push me, not that my parents weren't concerned, they were, but she just saw, I guess, the worst of it because we were really close and like she could see, because like every every eating disorder is super, super different, but anorexia especially is just a very like sneaky disorder. So she was able to see a lot of like the habits that I was doing. It wasn't just like me not eating dinner with my family. It was, you know, Whatever, whatever I was doing, she was just able to see it more and tell my parents about it. And at the time, my parents didn't understand it at all. Mm -hmm. um, so they're just mad. They're just mad that I'm hurting myself. Um, they're just trying to be disciplinarians. They're they're trying to be disciplinarians. They're concerned and they're sad, but they're more just mad because they're like you're you're like like uh, I, at the time I was you know a relatively successful hairdresser, like had my own business or like. You're smart. I don't know why you're doing this, but it has it has nothing to do with any of that. It's a mental disorder at the end of the day. So bless their hearts. They went and like took classes on it and like to understand it and everything like that. So again, yeah, if they didn't go through all those steps. That's so important because inability to help initially yeah. stemmed from not them not caring. No. It was not them trying what they knew best, which was yes. the discipline approach. Yes. But then not understanding what the illness was about. Yes. And then they pursued avenues to yeah. improve that. And then they were able to help. They did. Yeah, they did as, as much as they can. You know, sure. it's like hard. Like even, even today, they don't like fully, fully understand it. And I try to help them understand it a little bit because I still struggle with it every day. Um, but yeah, I, it, I, I'm very thankful for them to have gone through that. And like anybody out there that's struggling with it or knows somebody struggling with it, it is worth it to like Learn research more. about yeah. it like because because there's such a huge stigmatism around eating disorders in general that it's just image and it is so not like that's What's, like that's the biggest misconception you think? i'd say in understanding it at least and for okay. other people like it's different for everybody of course maybe some people it is what other avenues besides for, image that exist so i'll just i'll just speak on my behalf because mm -hmm. everybody's so different but for me and this is through going through a lot of like out, outpatient and therapy and all this stuff and understanding why I'm doing it. It was, uh, it coincided with, uh, my depression. I had like mild OCD and, um, it was all about control mm. because I felt out of control and it was about hurting myself and not in an obvious way, not as in like some people cut, some people do, but that was a way of hurting myself. And, yeah, it was, it was hard to wrap my head around at first. Um, but yeah, my whole thing revolved around having that one little thing that I can control in my life. Whether if I couldn't control my job, I couldn't control my relationship that I was in at the time or whatever, X, Y, Z, all these things. But it was my my one thing that I could. So um, yeah, that that that's what it was for me. And then it, it revolved a lot around obsessive compulsive numbers like whether it's scale numbers, caloric numbers, how many steps you're taking, like it just all, it didn't, didn't really matter about the image as much as it did about that kind of stuff. Just having that repetition and routine. Mm -hmm. Almost the same way that someone, when they think touching a doorknob multiple times is what an OCD yeah, or my, yeah. symptom might look like. Exactly. But this was surrounding calories. Yeah, like or, everything I said. As an example. But yes, yeah. as one of the examples, for sure. And it's not that I thought, 
like something bad was going to happen if I didn't, but it was just like, your mind was it, pushing you it, on top of all that all, on the OCD stuff. It was, um, just extremely horrible thoughts behind all of that. So it's like, if I don't accomplish these things, then I'm a, like, I'm disgusting I'm or a failure. I'm a failure. That's probably the biggest one mm-hmm. or yeah. And it's just all this self-talk. It's like having a devil on your shoulder through your whole day. Like even mm-hmm. if you're not, not in, in any position where you're eating, like if I'm, you know, I don't want to say whatever, if I'm, Walking on the street, mm-hmm. I'm thinking about uh, if my sister texts me and say, hey, you want to go out to dinner or something like that? Mm-hmm. Then I have to think about, okay, the rest of my day is going to look like this and I need to make up for this. And then after I need to make up for that. And then it's just, it's like constant and it just like overrides your entire life. And you become a miserable, miserable person. And I was for years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the, the devil on your shoulder that you describe is what I, in a medical sense, would coin the irrational worries or irrational thoughts that we as humans all have cognitive distortions, if you will, where basically everyone is susceptible to this. It's almost like complete human nature that we have these cognitive distortions or irrational thoughts where if I get 10 A's, but I get one C, that means I'm a failure. Mm -hmm. That's an irrational cognitive distortion because Mm -hmm. getting 10 A's and one C by any one's definition does not mean failure. Yeah. It means you failed one test or maybe didn't get as great of a test. And just replacing that thought with a more rational thought, like, yeah, I didn't do great on this test, but it doesn't mean I'm a failure, yeah. doesn't make you not feel sad. The goal of therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy is not to not make you feel sad. Yeah. It's to take away some of the power and give yourself some of the power back. Is that what you experience in that's, therapy? That's exactly it. And it, it's like, I was very repellent in all the therapy I went to, group therapy, psychiatrist, all that kind of stuff. Repellent. Uh, just, I, I didn't, everything that they told me, I was just you're an idiot. Like I know, mm. like pushing it away. I'm the exception to I the was, rule. I was, yes. Yeah. I'm smarter. Like everything you're saying, or I know that these people haven't gone through it. So they don't know, even though that they've, they have medical degrees or this kind of thing. Like mm. you still don't understand what I'm going through. So at the end of the day, it is completely up to you to use those tools. And whether I liked it or not, I was learning tools like mm. through all of that, whether it's like a grounding situation Whereas like you're just sitting in a room and you just need to like name five things in the room or just like like, a DBT now or yes. Yeah, exactly. Or just um, literally just doing the exact opposite of what you're thinking. And it, that gives you more power Mm -hmm. and no, I'm still not happy about that. And I'm still sad about it, but it's, I'm not giving into the bad thoughts. You're not spiraling. I'm not spiraling. And like I get, if I give into the ED thoughts, then I'm happy with myself, but in a bad way. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's an unhealthy coping mechanism. It's an unhealthy coping. That's exactly what Whereas it is. Whereas naming five things in a room, healthy coping Exactly, mechanism. exactly. So it's like taking some of the things where I was like, okay, yeah, I can, I can do that and finding things that did help me. But there was lots of things that didn't help me. Like I'm not that great at meditation. Like it's just mm-hmm. not something I'm good at. Um, and it was hard because like my thing is like walks and like, outpatient, inpatient, like you're not allowed to walk. So it's like, or you're not allowed to be active. And that's like one of my escapes. Hmm. Um, Why so do they say you can't be active? That's Cause I was on like, at the, oh, t- at the time yes, I'm on cal- death's door. Caloric restriction. And yes, it, it's all about that. Even, yeah. even though I'm saying that, that's the little devil on my shoulder being like, oh, we can get steps in. Mm-hmm. We can, you know what I mean? So it's well, just I, like- I've worked in adolescent uh, eating disorder um, facilities. Yeah where literally you'll have seven-year-olds hiding behind a bed and doing push-ups and sit-ups yeah. to try and burn extra calories. Yeah. And this is not an image thing for them. They, they don't even, they're not even aware of what society image would want them to look yes. like or puts out from a society perspective. So yeah. it's not a culture thing. Yeah, exactly. And for, and for me too, it's like, uh, it, I had, I got diagnosed with a bunch of stuff, but or, orthorexia too, in, in terms of like just only being able to eat like healthy foods as well. Like mm-hmm. it was, like a sin for me to eat anything bad. So it was like for me to get out of that or during my recovery. And even now, um, one thing that's extremely helpful to me is for other people to order food for me Mm -hmm. or like, or not like order food for me, but like if I'm in a situation where I'm with another person, I don't even look at the menu and I'm just like, you order for me because I still struggle with that. So it's like, that's another thing that's really helped me. So, because I already know too much. Yeah, and it's almost what, like all of that, what we're describing, the disordered eating, the anorexia, all of these words 
are really manifestations of how you're feeling on the inside. 100%. So those things can manifest themselves in a variety of different ways, whether you start counting your calories obsessively and uh, not being able to have control in that way, or you start gambling so much that you're out of control with your gambling, losing your life savings. Yep. But ultimately, it's a reflection of those feelings and thoughts that drove you to feel that way or yeah. act that way, rather. Yeah. So like the, the, the really the triangle of actions, feelings, thoughts is an important triangle for people to start at least initially exploring when I start giving the intro of what therapy will be like. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times, as we just discussed in our healthcare system, it takes a while to get people in. Yeah. So as the first touch point as a primary doctor, I at least try and give an intro. Yeah, that's great. Because it seemed like your doctor did it. No, yeah, no, he didn't. And the, the, what did you say? The feelings, thoughts and... And actions. Actions. Yeah. yeah, I think I think I went through that in outpatient or something like that, some mm -hmm. sort of triangle, and we, and you had to explain what each one was. Mm -hmm. And but yeah, no, I didn't have that initial thing, so I was so resistant to it because there was no like understanding of what was going on. It was just me, and looking at just googling stuff, sure. trying to understand and there, what it was. Too and, hard to. And it's yeah, and then it, all choices. you can get is the description of what the ED is, and <laughs> yeah. you're like, well, well, that's kind of what it is, but mm. it's also kind of this. So it's like everybody's so different. Yeah, because I mean, if you look at whatever word you want to choose, an addiction, substance addiction, gambling addiction, yeah. food addiction, it it'll just say using that thing that changes your neurotransmitters yeah. to the point where you don't have control and it destroys your life. Yeah. In one aspect of your life at yeah. least, or a few aspects of your life. And in then in our diagnostic manuals, it's for a specified period of time, yeah. not just like it happened once. Right. It happened for an extended period of time. Um, but in reality, it's so much more than that because a person is rarely their diagnosis. Yeah. Like you said that you had the diagnosis of anorexia. You weren't an anorexic that doesn't define you as a person because no. it doesn't tell me anything. Yeah. Like as a physician meaning. For sure. If you come in, you say, I, I was diagnosed with anorexia. <clears throat> okay. Well, what led to that? What was the reason? Was it image? Was it control over the numbers? Like that's where you actually There's learn who the patient is. For sure. One thing that's a little flawed in that too is that like, and in, I think in anorexia especially is that um, it's kind of hard and it's a hard way to put this, but like, you kind of have to like prove yourself to doctors yeah, for that anorexia diagnosis, which is not necessarily something I wanted, but it inside I did want to, I did want help. Like I wasn't happy with my life. I was miserable, mm -hmm. wanted to die. I looked terrible. I looked like I was on death's door. I wasn't happy with it. So when I go to the doctor and he's like, well, you know, like, yeah, you're you're like on the underweight BMI, but like I wouldn't say you're like anorexic. It's just like so like, you know, just eat a little more and listen and you're just like, "Oh fuck. Like I'm already I'm a failure again." Yeah. So I can't even convince the doctor that this exactly, is Exactly. Exactly. So it's like, "All right, well, like I'll show you." You know, it's like it's terrible, mm -hmm. but I think and I know because I went I went to uh outpatient with a bunch of people with different kind of eating disorders is that Everybody kind of had to like prove themselves in a way, which I understand because um, you don't want to just take everybody's word as like a grain of salt. Because like if no, somebody's suffering- No, you shouldn't understand that. That's- If, if somebody's suffering that's, from binging- That's a failure of the system. Yeah. So it's- Maybe on an individual level. But sure. systemically, that's a major flaw because I'll tell you the problem it creates. Yeah. A, it makes you feel like it's your fault when yeah. it fails. B, it forces you to overact your symptoms. And then what ends up happening is me as a physician, I'm like, why is this patient overacting? Are yeah. they seeking care for something that's not a problem and there's actually somewhere else a problem? Yeah. And now our whole line of communication is lost. The trust is lost. Yeah. So that's a healthcare system flaw, not something that. Yeah, yeah. Or like if it's just medication thrown in my face yeah. or something, which is like something I don't love to depend on, which I know it helps a lot of people. But for me, I've tried, you know, a plethora of different kind of med medications and I just. Yeah, that's going to be individual dependent. Totally. But it really should be something that I feel our healthcare providers, especially on the primary care sense of things, be better versed yeah. at having these conversations. Yeah. And I don't. We, just no. to finish the point, because yeah. I think this is valuable to what you are hoping to see changed, yeah. is we have simulated patient encounters mm -hmm. where we would go into the room and the patient's an actor. Mm -hmm. or, they're like, oh, I have high blood pressure, but I don't want to take this medicine and you have to 
talk them into it or explain the risks or whatever, find some mutual line of communication. And that's good training for diabetes, for heart disease, all stuff. But then we never do it for more complex ones that are mental health related. And those are the ones that are the most difficult Yeah, because you never know how how they're gonna go. And as a doctor, you cannot hope to have full control over that situation. Yeah, You have to be just ready to react in whichever way the patient needs support and whichever way the patient wants the conversation to go mm-hmm. and learn from every experience. Mm-hmm. And unless you do it, you're never gonna learn. And what you're gonna end up doing is, here's a referral, good luck. Yeah. Here's a medicine, good luck. And you're not really helping anybody by doing that. No, no, yeah. Come in with a stomach ache. You can fix that really yeah. quick. Come in with- I mean, yeah. not really, but yes. But you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's not that my head uh, With an appendicitis, that, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, sure. But yeah, it's like, it's your it's your mind on top of everything yes. else. So yeah, no, that's I think that's a huge flaw in the system for sure. I agree. Yeah. What, besides grounding, what's one of your strategies that you've used successfully? You journal a lot, right? Uh, no, actually, I don't. Like you're always sketching. I mean, I write and, scripts. Okay. I write, and that's maybe a way of coping as well as mm-hmm. this job came very shortly after I started recovery. Mm. Uh, about six, no, not even like four months after I started recovery. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was trying to find outlets because recovery has been... A nightmare for me. I've had ups and downs. It's nobody's recovery is linear. But anyway, at the time, I COVID happened, and then I had to uh, close down my salon, and that was one of my outlets. Was I'm an absolute workaholic. I have that kind of addictive personality, so that was ripped away from me, and I was just kind of sitting there like, what the hell am I gonna do? And then my little brother convinced me to get TikTok, and I was not. I'm not much of a consumer. I like to do things. So I was just like, I'll make some videos. And I've always, I I made like little skits for my family back in the day and that kind of thing. So I was like, and I love SNL and all these things. So I was like, okay, I'll make some skits or whatever. So that became my outlet. And I was unhealthily obsessed with that. I was like pumping out like seven, eight videos a day. Mm. Um, Well, just like how we said, you can get addicted to gambling. You can get addicted to That became my new thing on top of what the ED was a struggle, but it became kind of something else I could focus on besides just you know, being a recovering person. So I started writing and, and filming and and doing all these things not to become TikTok famous. That was not even on my radar. It was just kind of an accident. But yeah, it became my new like coping mechanism. And I'd say it still is in a way. And I don't know if that's healthy, if my job is kind of part of my coping mechanism. Well, I don't want to be the judge of that because a doctor should never be the judges. Yeah. And I'm not your personal doctor. Yeah. But what I think is important for you to make that distinction on your own is it sounds like before you were doing it to a degree that was very unhealthy, that was burning you out and creating more negativity, even though short term it abated some of that negativity. Totally a distraction method for sure. But here it sounds like it's becoming more of a positive outlet where you've gained control of how often you're creating content. Yeah. You have your own schedule where it's not now an unhealthy coping mechanism. Is that a correct assessment of what I'm looking at? I think so, yeah, because I went through over 365 days. I think it was like 380 something days of posting in a row. Like I never took a day off Mm -hmm. and it was like a goal of mine. Again, another like obsessive thing that I Mm -hmm. was doing. Um, And then I realized that I was like, oh, this is like becoming really unhealthy and I was getting burnt out. I was obsessing over having to post at the exact same time every day if I, and obviously I was getting more and more viewers at that time. So if I wasn't- So the reward was there. The reward was there for sure. And like, I don't, especially now, like I don't don't care about numbers, like it's whatever. But you you look at a video that you're, I I was just consistently growing. Like there was no going down. Mm -hmm. So it was like, oh, here's a new thing I can fail at or continue to do good at. And since I was posting every day, I was just like, well, if I stop posting every day, I'm gonna be a failure. So it just continued. And then I just got to a point literally where I broke down. I had given fully back into my ED. I had got into a deep, deep depression again, uh, having suicidal thoughts, all, all the whole barrage of things. And I was like, okay, something needs to give. I went back into therapy. And that was the consensus was like, you need to either stop all this together or find some sort of balance. So I had to like create a schedule for myself. And at first was still too much. Mm -hmm. Um, But now I think I've gotten to a place where it's like, I can manage, I can still manage to take care of myself or work on taking care of myself while still 
being you know, semi-successful at what I'm doing. Chris has done a ton of work to combat toxic inner voices, but what about toxic outer voices? As creators online, we are constantly confronted with brutal comment sections and uncalled for reaction or takedown videos. I wanted to know if Chris has found any methods of keeping her head above water when maybe the comments just aren't so friendly. It's probably like the worst job to go into if you're suffering from depression or ed or anything i was well, is it because i've seen well, so many individuals no, find comfort in a community no, and I'll, I'll like so it, it's good it's great and it's not great at the same time sure. which i don't know could be any job but since i'm being looked at under a microscope by 50 million people yeah. there is pressure there whether it's maybe not image as much but just to perform or to make people happy or to make sure people are like content with what I'm putting out. Totally agree. But before you start giving the details, yeah. as someone who's had mental health diagnoses yeah. and struggles, has going on social media made it more difficult, less difficult, or equally as difficult to manage those? I would say equally to more. Equally to more. And why? Now you can give the context. There's 50 million people looking at you under a microscope yeah, to perform, to make for them sure. enjoy it. Yeah, things. so I go into it already, you know, uh, with with all of my health issues. Um, and there are points in it where you get these highs where it feels good. There's that coping mechanism where I can do something I love, mm -hmm. which is definitely a positive to this job. I love writing. I love making people laugh. I love talking to people on the street that watch my videos and making their day. Love that. Um, but then there's just the, the pressure involved in the job. Like it's much different than me being a hairdresser, seeing one person a day and making that one person happy and turn that into 50 million people. So it's the pressure adds to, um, my own bad thoughts that I'm having that day. Maybe I'm having a good day and maybe, maybe it's okay. But if I'm having a bad day, it gets extra bad. Whereas if I wasn't doing this job because the pressure of all those people watching. If I'm having it like, or maybe it's not even a day, let's say I'm having months where I'm going through a really bad depressive episode. I need to wake up every day and I need to be funny. I need to make people laugh. I need to laugh. I need to put on this mask that feels fake to me. Um, and I have a wonderful audience that I, I really do, like I, I barely get any hate, which thank you. Um, <laughs> Well, there's going to be hate comments all in the world. <laughs> um, but I've, I've learned to not really uh, t take the hate, or I, I take the hate comments with like a grain of salt. Like it's whatever. Like I, I try to focus more on the positive. Those are the people I'm entertaining. If you're not enter entertained by that, that's fine. Go kick rocks. Like I don't care. There's lots of other people to watch. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's not as bad for me. It's just myself. It's just myself and the pressure I put on myself more than other people because my audience is like tells me in my comment section or I've made a couple mental health videos where they're like, take a break, like take a step back. We don't care. Like we'll be here when you get back. But there's the devil on my shoulder. That's like, they're not, that's not true. Like they're lying. Like, well, that's why therapy is for life. For all of us. hundred <laughs> percent. So yeah, it's, it's overcoming those, those thoughts every day basically. Mm -hmm. Cause that's what our job entails. It's like, we need to perform to a certain degree. So it's like uh, choosing my mental health or choosing to make people happy, essentially. Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard. Can I make an observation slash assumption? You tell me sure. if it's wrong. As someone whose core struggle with their mental health has been surrounding the idea of control, mm -hmm. social media is almost the place where you go to give up control because now 50 million people are controlling you in some way. Yeah. Has that made it problematic? Yeah, for sure. Mm. For sure. And not necessarily numbers wise. I try not to focus on that. And I think that stems from me coming into this, not really expecting a whole lot. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't expect this to become my career. Um, I mean, it's amazing, but yeah, it's, um, there's a lot of losing that control. So, but I think that's healthy for me in the same way. Mm. Because it's something I literally cannot, I, I have, I will never be able to control that. I will never be able to control the way people react to me. I will never be able to control the numbers. And I think that's okay. And I've come to terms with that. So mm. I think that is healthy for me in a way. That's why I'm like, it's good and yeah, it's bad. Yeah, almost because it's so extremely hard to control makes it easier for you to give up control. Exactly. Same way, terrible example, but very similar principle. 
the initial SARS virus was so lethal that it actually claimed less lives than the SARS-CoV-2 virus that caused COVID-19 yeah. because SARS-CoV-2 was less lethal. Right. So many people that didn't have symptoms spread it that it ended up killing more people. Right. So something that was milder ended up being more deadly. Yeah. This being so much harder to control may yeah. actually be easier it, for some re reason. First, yeah, in, in a weird way, in a weird mm -hmm. way it is because it, with, let's say, go back to food. It's like, I can control that. Like it, it is me, exactly, I'm the one condition. putting it into my mouth yeah. or whatever, or I'm the one exercising, I'm the one, I can do that, but like, I can't, I, there's no way to control the audience. Do you know where, what uh, population of people really thrive in a scenario like this? And I'm not recommending you become religious by any means, mm. but people who succumb to a higher, not succumb, uh, <laughs> succumb. believe to a higher power have faith. or have faith in a higher power, sure. they're a cog in the system that there's, there's a bigger plan for all of us, that giving up the control is actually quite healthy for them. Oh, my parents are going to love you. They're, my parents are... <laughs> and I'm, again, I'm not advocating no, no, no. for this. I'm just no, no, pointing no. out but the observation what you're saying, of that. No, it's it's true. And, and it's funny because the, the thing that my parents always say is just like, it's out of your control. Somebody has a greater plan for you. And it's and, and it's comforting. It's comforting mm -hmm. to know that. And, I, and I'm in a place where I'm like, I have no idea what there is or what there isn't mm -hmm. or whatever. But it's kind of like a beautiful thing that they say. And I'm like, God, I wish I could kind of like yeah. really believe, believe that. that. Yeah. And I want to, but it's kind of hard. But you're sense. you're totally, you're correct. Just in that observation that why people enjoy religion. It feels no, like because and that, of that. It kind of all makes sense. It's like, yeah. oh, wow. Yeah, like everything. And I like to think that like everything's kind of happening for a reason. It's out of my control. And, and going like taking myself. And this is another thing I do rather than the grounding is like taking myself completely out of it and like you know, putting myself in space and looking back down, it's like, God, everything's so small. Yeah. Everything I'm worrying about is so minute. Mm -hmm. It becomes more objective that way. Yeah. 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 What, um, what piece of advice from your life lessons learned on your very short time on this earth <laughs> could you share with people that might be going through a rough time? It, kind of what I just said. It's just like, we are all so much more concerned about ourselves, whether it's appearance or what other people think of us or little details, just little things. And we are all of our worst enemies. And if we take ourselves out of that or put yourself in somebody you love's shoes, would, would we look at ourselves the same way? No, we wouldn't. So it's, it's kind of, for me, at least I have to take myself out of my own shoes and, and look back at myself and be like, okay, like, if, if, if I was talking to myself right now and you were telling me, oh yeah, I got to post every single day for this. And like, people are probably going to hate me if I, you know, eat a cheeseburger on Friday. It's like, no, like that's like, you sound crazy or whatever. So it's like, uh, my advice is to just like, take yourself out of the situation. Uh, yeah, exactly. And just, just do, do some, it's hard to do realistic reflecting when you're in that kind of space. Mm -hmm. I've been there a million times. But um, it, it'll pass. Like, that's my biggest thing. Mm -hmm. It's like, no matter how deep I've gotten in shit, and I've gotten in some deep, deep, horrible thoughts, but like, I've, I've, I'm here today, mm -hmm. and I've made it past those situations. Yeah. So, uh, and finding that, a support system, if you that's can. Yeah. That's That's been my biggest mm -hmm. thing. And whether that's, it doesn't have to be your family, it could be a friend, it could be your doctor. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. You're saying a lot of evidence-based things. Great. Um, like when we say, when you're saying like, take yourself out of the situation as much as possible, we literally advocate for patients to write down their cognitive distortion thought that they're a failure because of X, Y, and Z, and just right next to it, write the rational thought that replaces it. Even if you don't believe it, just totally, write it. Totally. Yeah. And just putting it down or saying it out loud will already take a little bit of the power back to you. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the things you advocated for. And then something I tell patients is, their problems are not little problems because it seems demeaning for someone to say that Absolutely. when it's not them. Absolutely. But what we often do to ourselves is we hold up, the reason these problems are so big to us is because we're holding a magnifying glass on yeah. them. So like put the magnifying glass in your pocket and only take it out when you choose to. Yeah. Because yeah. having that choice of when to take it out is going to give you a lot of power back. Yeah. That's yeah. a great way of putting it. No, I agree. I think we covered a lot. I think we did. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. I think Thank it's going to help a lot of people. Therapy session. It's a therapy session because you're sharing with the world 
yeah. your true self. And I think when you're transparent about who you are, I think that's when shoulders feel lighter. I, I think so. It makes me feel better and it clearly has made other people feel better. And that's, I, I mean. Like there's no mask. There's no, no. That mask, that's, that, the thing that's is fatiguing. That it is, it is. And I like, yeah, I just think it's not doing my self service or my audience service for me to pretend to be something I'm not. So this is me, baby. Yeah. Accept it or don't. I don't know. <laughs> well, thank you for coming on the Checkup Podcast. Thank you for having me. If you enjoyed this conversation with Chris, you may enjoy watching me to compete with her head to head to see who can create the funniest TikTok videos. Click here to check that out or click here to watch me and her play Would You Rather on her channel. As always, stay happy and healthy.